is Pastor Joshua. For those of you who I haven't had the opportunity to meet, happy Resurrection Sunday, somebody. All right, I need a few more of y'all to be a little bit more excited about that. If you have your Bible, I'd love for you to meet me in uh, Acts chapter number uh, one. We will get there in just a few moments. There's an author and a speaker by the name of Sean Stevenson uh, who has built a platform around nutrition, fitness, and sleep. And his journey um, to his current platform came as a result of some significant health issues when he was a teenager. He was a talented sprinter in high school, uh, but around his sophomore and junior year, he was running at practice and he heard a pop in his hip and he came to find out that what he thought was a pulled muscle, he actually broke his hip. Imagine how devastating that is as a, as a young person very talented future uh, in sports to have this kind of thing happen only to find out a couple of years later when he was 20 years old that he had degenerative bone disease. And the doctor said, son, you actually have a spine uh, of an 80 year old man. He was told that this condition was incurable and he was just given some medication uh, to help. As you can imagine, this led to a deep, deep depression. Uh, his track career, as he knew it, was over, and he significantly gained uh, weight, about up to 50 pounds due to his depression. Then, one semester while he was uh, in college, he stumbled upon a nutrition course. And this actually shifted everything in his life, his curiosity about consumption and food and the things that he put in his body, it, it began to grow. He did more research and he asked more questions and he eventually asked his doctor, he said, doc, listen, uh, I, I'm just curious, uh, does my condition have anything to do with what I'm putting in my body, my, the, the food that I'm eating or, or the meds? And, and the doctor looked at him and said, no, son, you, you just have this this degenerative disease that has nothing to do with what you're putting in, in, in your body. And Sean was really confused by this response because immediately after the doctor says this, he gave him medication to put in his mouth. And so Sean slowly began to realize through his research and his study that he was uninformed and he was ignorant about food and the different things that he was consuming, including the medication. And there was a correlation between what he was actually consuming and his condition. And slowly, he discovered three things. Number one, the real purpose of food. Now, if you like me, like I love food, I enjoy food, but there's also a greater purpose for food. And Sean came to a realization of, of what this actually meant. And then secondly, there was proof from his own experience that what he consumed is significant. And then number three, he understood what this means for people and they're living their best lives. Now I know none of what I just said it's really groundbreaking. Like we are really smart people. We have access to research. Some of this stuff we already know. We, we are a little bit more informed in this generation. It also doesn't seem like anything that I said has anything to do with what we're celebrating today. Anything to do with Resurrection Sunday. It's a nice story about a guy who had some problems and he did some research and he changed his life around. Now he's got a platform and he's helping other people and all of that sounds good. But upon further review and when I really think about Sean's story, it is a resurrection story. It is a story related to life transformation, which is very much related to what we're talking about today. Because see, Sean had a discovery at some point that opened his eyes 
and completely shifted the trajectory of his life. And that's ultimately what this weekend is all about. A, a trajectory shifting moment in history that has to do with Jesus's resurrection. That's what the fuss of this weekend is all about. It's not about dressing up, although y'all look very, very good today. I, I put on a bow tie for you. I hope you liked it. It's not about the commercialization of, of, of Easter and, and eggs and a bunny, and I know we're going to have a hunt and all that. that. That's cool. It's fun. I'm not taking away from that. It's not about the nice dinner we're going to have afterwards. Hopefully you're having a nice dinner. But the resurrection is an eye-opening, trajectory-shifting moment from death to life. It's a powerful demonstration of God's love and his pursuit of us. And it represents an opportunity for us to decide to follow a new way, an eternal king who promised us a different life, both here and now and beyond. So some of us are aware of the famous scene in Matthew uh, 28, Three days since Jesus had been crucified, there were two ladies by the name of Mary, and they were headed to Jesus's tomb. They were very overcome with grief, very heavy hearted, and uh, so were his followers. They were all in a complete fog. Some of them are scared. Some of them are just completely crushed. Some of them are not sure, like, what is going to happen next? Imagine seeing Jesus exhibit such great power, such great strength, do and perform miracles, even raising people from the dead. Imagine seeing him do this, but also be brutally murdered. Imagine the Roman government, the most powerful government in the world at the time, giving religious leaders the opportunity to execute an innocent man with nothing that his followers, his family or his friends could do about it. Neither his disciples. But when Mary and Mary showed up to the tomb, it was good news, y'all. He was not there. The scriptures say that there was a violent earthquake and an angel descended. And, it, and he rolled back the stone and he was sitting on the stone and it says that the guards were shaken. They looked like dead men because of their fear. And we see in Matthew 28, it says the angel said, don't be afraid. Jesus is not here. He's risen. Go tell my homies. Go tell the disciples. I'm about to roll up on them in Galilee. Meet me there. And it says, Jesus met Mary and Mary on the way. And he said, don't be afraid. This was such a big deal that the religious leaders had to pay the guards because they said, listen, the word can't get out that Jesus is not here. We don't know where he is, but here's some money. Y'all ain't seen nothing. But it was too late at that point. And so Jesus meets up with his disciples, and he gives them two major things. Number one, he says, this, this idea of the great commission. He says, I want you to make disciples of all nations. I want you to baptize. I want you to teach everything I commanded you. It is known as the great commission and not a great mission because we are on mission with Jesus. So we are doing it together with him. And then secondly, he says, I'm going to give you all some help because you can't do this on your own. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit so that you can have a resource to get it done. Now, you can imagine that the disciples, this is probably not the conversation that the disciples want to have. The conversation that the disciples want to have is like, OK, Jesus, like, yo, you got to you got to rewind this back for us. You know what I'm saying? You got to talk to us about how this whole thing transpired. And oh, by the way, Jesus, like this whole kingdom that you're going to lead, like, are you going to restore it now? Are you going to like, like, how's this thing going to work? What's the game plan, bro? And here is how Jesus responded to them as we zero in on Acts 
chapter number one, verses seven through eight. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. For the rest of our time, I just want to use this subject I want to talk about what the resurrection means. I want to talk about what it means. Now, if I was in my, my uh, black Baptist church background that I grew up, uh, I, uh, the, the subject I would use was, can I get a witness? Some of y'all can track with me on that. Before we unpack these words that Jesus just uttered in Acts 1, verses 7 through 8, I, I think there's a couple things that we need to understand first. Yes, Today is absolutely about a celebration of Jesus' resurrection, which is victory over death. But it's also a significant invitation to join Jesus on mission here on earth. And the opportunity to experience life in a transformational way. All of that sounds really amazing, but I, I think that we do need to just kind of address the elephant in the room because some of us who do follow Jesus and have a relationship with Jesus and we are fully aware and fully immersed, or maybe we've been going to church for a long time, like, I, I think we forget that all of this stuff is just a little bit weird. It's just a little bit weird. It's a little bit confusing, right? That Jesus, okay, wait a minute, he's Jesus, but then he's God, but wait, wait, no, he's, G he's God in the flesh, and then like, okay, I, I don't want to, he dies for, the, for his creation, but then like, he comes back to life, he predicted his own death, but then like, he, but he's God, like, he could stop, like, all of that is just a little bit confusing, right? And what is it? really mean? Well, I'm so glad that you asked. Thank you so much for being very inquisitive. There's, there's three things that I just want to unpack really quick. Three questions. Number one, what is or was the purpose of Jesus's resurrection? Well, there was this thing that happened early in creation called the fall of man. And it was basically a situation where God and man and creation were in relationship together. And there was a separation in that relationship. It's called sin. And so because of sin, there was a separation between God and man in their relationship. Man uh, decided that he wanted to do his own thing. God said, hey, listen, I got the spread laid out for you. You can do all of this right here. You can have all of this. Just don't do this. And then you know what happened. We do that. And then if you have kids, you know how that works every day. This exposed humankind to evil, pain, and eventually death. None of these things were originally intended for us to experience. So then God did two things. Immediately, it says in the book of Genesis that God's response is he covers the man and the woman because they were naked and afraid, not the show. But they were, uh, they, were, they, were, they were aware of their nakedness, so God covers them. And then secondly, God then begins to reveal a redemption and an atonement plan. And so ultimately, God himself through Jesus atones for our sins, which is what we're celebrating today. He goes to the cross and, and he becomes a, a living sacrifice and he creates a way for us to be reconciled back to God. And what we have to understand is that the Apostle Paul, who wrote the majority of the New Testament, in his letter to the, 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 the Jesus followers in Rome, he says that in Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin is death. So, so that means that the cost or the price is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So what Jesus did is he took on that penalty and paid the price and wiped out of debt. It's like having uh, a significant debt in your account and then the next day seeing that the debt is gone. Somebody should praise right then. So, so that's, that's, that's what happened. And then we get a gift of eternal life, something that we did not 
earn. So this is the purpose of Jesus' resurrection. The second question is, what does Jesus' resurrection actually prove? Why do we care? Well, it shows us that God has unfailing love for his creation. He goes through a lot of trouble to be in relationship with us. And this is significant because we must understand that the demonstration of love at its core is about sacrifice. And some of us know this, but I know we have some guests here today. Uh, Pastor Charlie Mitchell, who's one of our teaching pastors, he just had a kidney transplant. And he's doing really well. God, is, it was a miracle that, that he, he received this kid. But, but the interesting part of this story is there's a woman named Brandy who lives in Florida who knew of Charlie, and God had been working on her heart to, to maybe donate a kidney, and she didn't know why. And it took several years, and she finally heard Charlie's story, and she came and told her husband, she said, it's Charlie. He's the one who needs this kidney. And when I think about myself, now listen, you only need one kidney, but you got two. But listen, I want to keep my two. Right. But what Brandy did was a, a, a sacrifice of love, not necessarily for Charlie, even though she knew it, but because of her relationship with God, because she is a follower of Jesus. So this is what what the resurrection proves is that God's unfailing pursuit and love for us. It also uh, tells us that God's word is true because Jesus uh, his, his death, burial, and resurrection was predicted several times. The coming of the Messiah was prophesied. And then get this. This is my last one right here. The Gospels are firsthand written accounts of people who were with Jesus. And then the epistles were uh, also letters that were written to Jesus followers or people who had connection to Jesus. But here's the thing. The disciples... And these people who wrote these epistles, they all suffered very violent deaths. Do you think that I'm going to dedicate my life to something that isn't true? And I'm going to sacrifice my life for it? This is a significant thing that I think we either overlook or we're unaware of. Here's the third thing. So number one, what was the purpose of Jesus' resurrection? Two, what does Jesus' resurrection prove? Why do we care? And then number three, what does it mean to you and I personally? Well, first and foremost, it means that there's more to life than what is just on the surface here. And God has more in store for us than what we can see. Now, I don't watch a lot of TV, but uh, what I do watch, it really falls into like three categories. It falls into sports, um, the animal planet, and home decor. I know that's an eclectic mix. I, I know... I know you, we can talk about it later, but, but that's pretty much kind of what, what I watch. And so one of the shows that I like um, on HDTV is called Fixer the Fabulous. Some of you know that show, have seen it. And oh, I got a couple of witnesses over here. All right. And there's this one episode where there's a young lady who's, who's getting her, her own house for the first time. And, and, and her mother is, is driving her uh, to the house. And, and they're both excited. And, and as we all know, like when there's a transformation, like you can see the transformation. Like, like extern, it just looks great. They show you the before and, and, and then they show you the after. And it, it, just, it just looks amazing, right? But then when you go into the house, you know, there, there's another level of transformation that happens that you can only see if you go in, right? Because from the outside, many things look good, but when you go on the inside, it might not look that good, right? So you go in and you see the show, oh, we moved this wall and we put this in and we put this tile down and all. But on this particular episode, I, I love this because they, they, they show the entire house and they say, you know, we got one more thing we want to show you. Come on in the kitchen. So she comes in the kitchen and and they have this island there and they then push the island counter back and it slides back. And there's a little door and there's stairs down to a wine cellar that you can't see just by look. You, you have to you have to go in and experience it. And so this is what Jesus is inviting us into. He's inviting us into a transformation that's deep, deep down that you can't see unless you fully engage and experience on your own. 
It's not just about coming to church. It's not just about going through the rituals. No, it's about engaging intimately so you can. You would never know that this existed if you even went into the house. You wouldn't know. You have to be invited. Someone would have to show you and invite you in to another level. And that is what this means to us personally. Jesus is inviting us into a transformation from death to life. Now, here's the thing. It doesn't mean with this invitation that everything is going to be copacetic. It's going to be all good all the time. I wish that was the case. But even Jesus himself said, yo, homie, check it out. You're going to have some trouble in this life. But take heart. I have overcome the world. So what that means is that we don't have to settle for the things that are in this world that are overpromised and then they underdeliver on a regular basis. We got a house full of overpromised stuff that underdeliver, right? Products we bought or experiences that just didn't deliver or it's just not sustainable. And so Jesus said, listen, I'm offering you abundant life. And I'm offering you the living water where you would never thirst again. And I'm offering you my presence. So now that we have all of that, let me just zero in for just a couple more minutes. Because I, I just want to touch on what Jesus said in Acts 1.8. Now that we have this, this, this context, the, G, the, the disciples are concerned about Jesus establishing his kingdom because they still fully don't get it. They, they, they seen the resurrection. They, they, they are experiencing just this miracle, but, but their minds are still on an earthly kingdom. They, they still don't fully get it. They still don't fully understand. And they're asking, you, yo, just give us the deets, bro. Give us the details. Like what's, what's going down? What's, what's, what's happening? And, and Jesus says to his disciples, y'all chill. All right. It ain't for you to know. Like, don't worry about that. Don't focus on those things right now. And I think the disciples are a lot like us. We want to know all the details. Jesus, I'll follow you. Like, this sounds great. Like, just let me get the fine print. Let me, let me, let me just make sure. Let me get all the steps so that I can, I can be prepared. That it, doesn't, it doesn't work that way, unfortunately. But here's what Jesus says. He says, you'll, you'll get basically more, clear, more clarity when you... Uh, have more experience with following me. And so he says two things. Number one, you will receive power. Now, you need this because there's no way you can do it in your own strength. So Jesus is the example of how we live. The Holy Spirit is the power to actually do it. My son, um, Isaiah, he says he wants to be a builder. I'm still trying to figure out what that actually means. Um, so we're exploring. We're experimenting of like what kind of building does he want to do. So I try to invite him into things and do things with him. So the other day we're putting together a little um, a desk and we need to put the legs on the desk. And so I said, Isaiah, come on. I, I'm going to give you this drill and I'm going to put the little um, screws in there and then, and then we're going to drill. Now, now we got to do it together. Now, he's, he's seven. You know, he thinks he can do a lot of things on his own. He can't. So I'm like, we got to do it together. And, and so he's, he's trying to drill it. And then I'm, get, I'm pulling it back because he's stripping the, the you know, the, the screws, right? Because he doesn't have enough power. So I've got to put my hands on the drill with him and push down so that it can actually go into the desk. This is what the Holy Spirit does for us in our lives is the Holy Spirit activates in us and helps us to do what we cannot do on our own. Yeah. And then in Romans 8, 31, 8 and 11, it says this. If the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. So the resurrection is good news for us because we get that same power to resurrect our own bodies and to resurrect the things that are dead in us and bring us from death to life. The second thing Jesus said is, you will be my witness. So you will receive power and then you will be my witness. This is a testament. This is what it means 
to, to, to be a witness. And it means a couple of things. The, the first one is a, a testament or an overflow of your own experience that, that you have actually engaged in. And it's both what you experience and what you demonstrate in your life. This is why we like reviews, right? We like reviews of restaurants. We like reviews of products. We need to know other people's experience before we invest, right? Well, the people who write the reviews, they are witnesses, yeah. right? Now, there's another aspect of our lives where people aren't writing reviews, but we're watching how they live. Yeah. That's called demonstration. So you are a witness to what you say you believe or what you value and how you live. You are witnesses. And so Jesus is saying that as you are empowered, you will be my witnesses. You will be a reflection of how you live. The other thing that witness means that we don't necessarily like. In the original Greek that it is written in, the word martus means martyr. That's what witness means. And so it also means that you, we will suffer like Jesus suffered. That's not really that exciting. We don't love that part. But here's the thing. It's not like we don't have a point of reference for suffering, right? We just like the suffering that we choose. Like if I'm going to go to the gym, you know, I'm choosing to suffer, all right? Cause I want my body to look good. I want to be healthy. Like I'm going to choose that. If I'm going to not buy this thing over here because I want to save, I'm choosing to abstain from this experience or this thing that might cause some temporary suffering. I'm, I'm cool with doing that. You know what? I, I'm actually going to choose to forgive you even though I'm hurt and I want this, this situation to not have happened. So forth and so on. I'm choosing that. And the reason we choose that suffering is because we believe that there's something greater on the other side. And all Jesus is saying is if you suffer with me, there is something greater in this life and on the other side. Jesus is not inviting us into a bunch of rules. He's not inviting us into a life of just restrictions for restrictions sake. But what he's inviting us into is relationship that produces results beyond what we can imagine or think. Let me see if I can land a plan for us like this. I opened up talking about Sean Stevenson, this influencer who is about health and fitness and sleep. And um, he's written a bunch of, of, of great things and has an amazing podcast. And he himself is a witness to health transformation. And I, I love what he said when I listened to one of his interviews. He said, I, I didn't look like someone who lost weight. He said, I looked like someone who was healthy. And he said one of his professors took notice uh, after he had had him one semester and then he came back and, and, and he had had him the, the next semester. And, and, and the, the, the professor said, well, what happened? You, you look so healthy. And by the way, I'm, I'm not sure if, if, if Sean is a follower of Jesus or, or not, but it is, it's, his story is relevant um, to my point. And my point is this. Everyone wants to experience transformation in their life. Everybody um, wants, if there's a graph of your life, everyone wants the graph of your life to look like up and to the right. Although that's not reality. But, but, but that's what we that's what we desire, right? But part of how transformation happens is when we actually get clarity in our lives. And I want to just show you this chart. I want to, I, this, this, this little graph, graphic I put together here. I, I want to just, just use this to, to help us understand. I, I think what begins to happen when we think about clarity is there's a, there's a revelation phase. There's a discovery phase. There's something new, something we learn, something we experience. There's, there's the eye-opening experience. But, but that's, that's only part of what happens when it comes to us getting clarity. That's, that's only one level. That's only the baseline. Because what we discover and what is revealed to us then needs to be applied. There needs to be some implementation 
of what we have discovered or what has happened. Just like Sean had to, had to take his discovery and say, oh, you know what? I need to make some of these changes and apply them to my life. I need to implement them in my life. And part of the, implementation, uh, the, the implementation phase is what I call the decision phase. We actually have to make a decision. And when you decide, all right, the suffix side means to kill. So we're actually cutting off all the other options in this phase. And then once we go from revelation to implementation, then we go to the evaluation phase. I, I call this the, the digestion phase. Right. So we discover and then we decide and then and then these things then need to get into our system. Right. In order for us to evaluate, like what is happening, what is changing? Let me see what is going on. And as we as we do these things, it produces clarity in our lives. It, it shows us. OK, this is the result of my decision. This is the result of of. Uh, of me taking this revelation and applying it to my life. And I think what happens to many of us is we, we stop either at the revelation or the implementation phase and we don't get full clarity and we don't experience the fullness of God. We don't experience the fullness that Jesus is calling us into with his resurrection. And so the resurrection of, of Jesus it confirms and it demonstrated clarity for the disciples and for us. Because what was prophesied was real and what Jesus said was true. But in order to get the clarity ourselves, we have to implement, we have to decide. And he invites us to experience this resurrection in our lives to move from death to life. And here's the thing. The power of the Holy Spirit at work in us should produce the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, and then those other ones we don't like, perseverance, long suffering, you know, like all of that stuff. Like, like that, that's the litmus test. It should mean that we look and live different. It should mean that, like, as people experience us, they're like, hey, there's something different. Why didn't you respond the way that I thought you would? Or, or why do you still forgive or love or engage in this way? There should be some way that is different about us. That makes us witnesses. That means that there's, that there's an experience of resurrection in our lives. And people should question, what happened to you? Or why do you, why do you live like this? So here's the next step that I want all of us to consider. As I close, I think there's just two groups of us. Number one, I think they're the believers in Jesus. And the question for you is, is the resurrection of Jesus evident in how I live my life? Is it evident in how I make decisions? Is it evident in how I love? Is it evident in how I engage my neighbors? Is it evident in my life? And what does true sacrifice look like? Because if we're true followers and believers of Jesus, then we understand that it requires great sacrifice. And that is the barometer by which we judge and we live our lives. Are we sacrificing in the way that Jesus called us to? And does it reflect in our lives? The second question is for those who are not believers or, or not followers of Jesus. We've got an important decision to make. Do we decide to take a step and follow Jesus? Put aside all of the other options and say, I'm, I'm, I'm really going to pursue. If, if you want to do that today for the first time, we want to invite you to do that. Very simple thing. We just want you to text the word Jesus to the number on the screen. Very simple process. And we'll follow up with you and we'll walk alongside with you. We'll give you resources. We'll help you. Take those steps. Because if I'm being honest, like, I mean, we can go to a bunch of cool gatherings, sing some songs, and it'd be dope. But that's not what we're here for. We, we want to gather and we want to we wanna be together. We want to support one another in life transformation. That's what we want to invite each other into and then walk with each other along the way in this process. 
Jesus didn't give the disciples the whole plan. And he's not going to give us the whole plan. But what he is giving is power, which is the presence of his Holy Spirit. And he said, as a result, you will be my witnesses. And the more you walk with me, the more clarity you will get. And there will be more evidence of a resurrected life. 